so uh, this uh, this is something. According to social media, I predicted the plot of the MCU Fantastic Four movie seven years ago. Which is to say that a movie gossip person said in the course of reporting on the Fantastic Four casting rumors that a potential detail from part of a concept pitch that I did as a what-would-you-do thought experiment imagining a hypothetical MCU Fantastic Four back in 2017 on the old In Bob We Trust version of the show might also be part of the actual movie they're making now, or rather, we're developing up until the current strikes and will presumably start developing again whenever the studios stop being fucking greedy bastards, give the writers what they're asking for, make their deal with the Actors Guild, etc, etc. As regards the the rumor itself, I mean, it comes from Grace Randolph, who's generally full of it and kind of terrible, and I don't really like to even acknowledge that she or her stuff exists. But instead, I think very admirably, Disney has outrightly fired Gunn. And again, I think it's admirable that Disney took such decisive action, especially with no major trades willing to cover the story. Pepperidge Farm remembers. The 11th commandment. Thou shalt not get away with it. does apparently have people leaking good intel to her sometimes, so who knows. I mean, maybe this is a thing, maybe it's not. The thing is, as I've always hastened to add about this since it's come up a few times, I was never the first person to suggest the thing I'm getting credit for suggesting, but it actually does mean a lot and feels good to see people remember this after seven years and shout me out about it, so I went back and rewatched both episodes I made laying it out, and yeah, actually, that was a good one, right? Kinda holds up. And since a fully new episode on the other end is taking some time to finish, I thought I'd give this a refresh since people are talking about it, you know, represent both parts and talk about it in hindsight, since, holy shit, what if I did call it about some parts of this, even though it really was more of a fan fiction thing than a prediction or a theory. And to be honest, that's really what made the difference as to whether or not to remake it into its own new thing, is that as a prediction video, it's whatever, but as a discussion, I guess, of how story works, how story doesn't work, the way Marvel does stuff versus the way other movies do stuff, a uh, background of my thoughts, feelings about storytelling in this genre and about the Fantastic Four in general, I think has more value than the prediction stuff would, whether it turns out to be right, which I think is like, you know, like a very minor chance. Like I said, I'm grateful for the credit, feels good, but I don't think that the stuff I am confident about having quote-unquote got right about this was a particularly big reach. But talking about how narrative works versus how narrative doesn't work, especially since, in my perhaps arrogant opinion, so much of nerd media completely has no fucking idea what it's talking about in that regard, but pretends like it does, or thinks it does, yeah, I think that has value, sure. So, yeah, here's that. Gonna run the clips, almost entirely in order, with minimal edits and some stuff moved around to get some points clarified up front, that kind of thing, and put links to the old ones down in the description so you can see that too if you like, but, uh, yeah, here's that. Jesus, did I remember to turn the mic on? Oh, thank God. All right, I said I was gonna do it, so let's do it. You know the drill. Imaginary thought experiment pitches for famously difficult movie projects, our subject this time being the hypothetical return of the Fantastic Four to the Marvel Cinematic Universe proper. Now, the problem with doing the Fantastic Four in the Marvel Universe is always going to be that the Fantastic Four themselves were the first true Marvel Age superheroes. Yes, Captain America and Submariner came first, but they did so in very different Golden Age circumstances, and they both later got reimagined in very different forms after the Fantastic Four had debuted and set the new tone. As such, by now a lot of what made them unique and original has been harvested by other properties. And if there's one important takeaway from the stunning failure of Iron Fist, it's that but not with this specific character we haven't is not a good enough reason to adapt something whose themes and gimmicks have already been adapted better elsewhere. So how do you give a new superhero family story a reason to exist in an era where team-ups are now the norm for the genre and pseudo-family family teams have been especially done to death by everything from Avengers to Guardians of the Galaxy to Lego Batman to Justice League and New Mutants? Probably. Boy, out of everything in there, that uh, that vague sense of possibility that either Justice League or New Mutants might be even halfway watchable is the thing that aged like milk there, huh? I mean, on a personal note, I've also got some mixed feelings about being in significantly better physical shape now than I was back then, but also, man, I, I really started going gray not long after this, and, and I am not a big fan of that. Oh well. And that's not even touching on the incredible sky-high and who knows what else I'm leaving out. 
Also, how do you handle how old-fashioned and, well, goofy the Fantastic Four and their powers just are? Well, I think I've worked out a way. It's gonna take more than one episode to explain, the format's gonna have to be a little different, but I think you're gonna like it. At least, I hope so, because a lot of you have been asking for it, so you'd better. So, by new format, I mean that instead of just hitting the broad strokes, I'm gonna imagine a whole complete hypothetical pitch. Characters, story, themes, arcs, place within franchise, etc. And since that means attempting to visualize a movie that doesn't have visuals, that means you'll be seeing a lot more of me in this one. Drink it in. But before we go further, I just want to once again remind everyone that these things are mainly thought experiments just for fun, basically a form of fan fiction. And even if you do think whatever bullshit I come up with here is better than what the real filmmakers come up with or might come up with, the fact is all I'm doing is spitballing an outline full of ideas. I'm not writing a script, I'm not working with studio notes, I'm not planning around budgets and schedules, laboring under deadlines, I'm not doing any of that. So it's not really a fair comparison and to frame it as such is a disservice to the working screenwriters who do the heavy lifting in this industry. So please just keep that in mind. Anyway, I'm Bob, the show is in Bob We Trust, and this is how I would fix the Fantastic Four in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. For those of you who are newer here to the scenery, In Bob We Trust was basically what we had to call the big picture for the period between my two tenures at The Escapist, which originally broadcast the series because it wasn't until the second time through that I owned the rights to that title and all the branding, and when the second contract was up, which occurred somewhat inconveniently in the midst of the worst part of the COVID pandemic, the lone bright side was that I retained the rights to the series and got to keep the original name when we went indie again, and uh, oh, speaking of that whole plague situation, in case anyone forgot, and since we're talking long-term events in reshaped entertainment business, Q. PSA? The COVID pandemic isn't over. The COVID pandemic is still worse than you think it is. The COVID pandemic was always worse than you thought it was, and it's not going to go away, nor was it ever going to go away, by wishing really hard that it would, pretending that it was never there in the first place, or through any means other than medical research that was always going to take longer than you or I likely wanted it to, because that's how science works. The reason you might think that any of this is not the case is because the world around us has been asked to go back to normal, and most of us have been varying degrees compliant. Not because what any of us just said is untrue, but because we exist under capital capitalism, mass media is very effective, and it worked on you. The fact is, there was a global plague, exacerbated by global institutional incompetence and uncaring that in addition to killing and disabling millions of us, effectively froze entire sectors of global economic commerce, specifically in media and consumer goods, for about two and a half years. And because the wealthy 1% of individuals and political institutions worldwide who lost out in that period financially decided that was quite long enough for their losses to continue, the rest of us have been all asked to not only go back to normal, but also to forget as quickly as possible that those two and a half years of global plague ever happened in the first place, or at least that it wasn't really that bad. Which is why most corporate entertainment media and entertainment media reporting that merely repeats talking points either without examination or with an agenda of its own never mentions it when talking about studio profits, corporate profits in general, box office, streaming numbers, TV ratings, company consolidation, audience tracking, wages, unions, spending, buying, all things directly related to and affected by the pandemic from the start and still affected in ongoing ways. Therefore, in the same way that you'd be very skeptical of any historical presentation about significant events of the mid-1940s that failed to mention, oh, and also World War II was happening, so that probably affected this in some respect, you should have that same skepticism and apply it to anyone talking about anything happening in business, politics, or culture that does not make, oh, also, that global viral plague probably contributed to this too, a central part of their thesis, because it is central to everything, whether we want it to be or not, for the foreseeable future. Thank you for listening, and stay safe. Okay, since I'm doing the whole damn shebang here and we are talking about a hypothetical Marvel movie, we don't start out with the movie itself. We start out with a post credit scene in whatever ends up as the previous most recent Marvel movie, wherein the superhero star or stars of said movie are chilling out and being social in New York City, along with whatever other MCU superhero actors are available on the day. Suddenly, a report comes in of an unidentified flying object having materialized in near-Earth orbit and now falling fast towards the city. The heroes act fast, confront the mystery projectile, guiding it into a safe splashdown in the Hudson River, and discovering that the UFO is actually a Kennedy-era NASA space shuttle. And if one of the heroes is one of the older guys, like Iron Man or Hank Pym, maybe you stick some kind of identifying insignia on the tail fin so they can go, no, it can't be. 
And then just as the police and the fire rescue teams show up to assist, kaboom! Big fiery explosion tears open the hull and a huge orange rock monster arm punches up into the frame. Hold, cut to black, see you in six to eight months. Yep, this was far enough back that we weren't factoring for this might be a Disney Plus thing in two months, this might be answered by a Disney Plus thing in two months, and look, I'm, I'm not even anti-Disney Plus Marvel stuff overall, but it certainly was a different scene, right? Okay, so for the movie proper, we do not open on that post-credits moment. Instead, we open with the traditional origin of the Fantastic Four. Square-jawed super scientist Reed Richards breaking into a launch site in order to commandeer his own experimental spaceship and launch anyway, even though the government has cut his funding and said he's not allowed to. With him is his best friend and pilot Ben Grimm, his fiancée and research partner Sue Storm, and her pain-in-the-ass teenage brother Johnny because she's his legal guardian and he pretty much has to be there. They all get into the spaceship, confident in Reed's abilities, and in an action-packed defiance of all the government and army guys, they blast off for outer space as the on-screen text informs us that this momentous day happens to be November 8th, 1961. Yes, the same day and date as the first issue of the original Fantastic Four comic was published. The Fantastic Four of the Marvel Cinematic Universe will be a family of superheroes from the early 60s with all the period-specific behaviors, mannerisms, outlooks, and aesthetic preferences that imply. Alright, so apparently this is what was said on that one gossip person's feed that got people to tag me and start this all up, that the Fantastic Four themselves come from the 60s and are out of their time like Captain America was in the new movie. Now, I'd heard this rumor off and on for a while, back when I first suggested it, I'd heard it. Like I said, it wasn't the first time, I wasn't the first person to suggest it, I've heard it a few times since before this. It's been a thing that's bounced around. People have told me that I'm the person that they heard it from most. Maybe that's true, I don't know. But pretty much since they've started putting this current version of the project together, it's been going around that they were at least going for a retro vibe. This is the first time in a little while that I've heard the time travel thing start up again, though. It seems like there's a general agreement that the Fantastic Four need a retro thing to stand out, that what distinguishes them from other Marvel characters is that they are so specifically and distinctly tied to the era of their inception visually, uh, they've got Dante Ferretti booked for the production design. He's a legend. He's worked for Scorsese, Zeffirelli, Fellini. I mean, go look at his filmography. He was the production designer on Sallow, The Decameron, Julie Tamer's Titus, Casino, Baron Munchausen. I mean, you don't call that guy if you're not doing something interesting, usually with some very specific flair, at least in theory. Again, some or all of this could be bullshit, or not. I remember back before they tried the first time, it was almost going to be a movie just straight up set in the 60s. Maybe that's what they're doing again. People really liked WandaVision and the retro vibe in Loki. At this point, anything can happen. And the same accident that gives them their superpowers will also simultaneously fling them forward in time to the contemporary, present-day Marvel Cinematic Universe, thus granting license to unapologetically use the characters in the authentic, old-fashioned, kitschy 60s personas they've always worked best in, and to pack the movie with retro-futurist design sensibilities and retro-cool early 60s fashion, music, and decoration. Marvel meets Mad Men. In fact, that would pretty much describe this version of Reed Richards. What if Tony Stark was also Don Draper. Cool, right? And I can't even take credit for that part. This is actually a fan theory that's evidently been in circulation among fandom on the internet for quite some time. I first heard about it from a friend on Twitter, and I'm told Diamanda Hagen is also incorporating it into a Fantastic Four speculation video of her own. In any case, wherever it comes from, I agree it is a perfect place to start from. Seriously, Marvel, steal this part steal it from someone. But you might ask, how is this different from what they already did with Captain America? Well, the thing is, what makes Captain America work, especially in the MCU, is that no matter what, you always know he's gonna do the right thing. Like in Winter Soldier at the beginning, when the Falcon assumes he must be having it rough in the future, and instead Cap is all, no, actually, I'm focused on all the positive things about today. Because the whole point of that character is that he was already the best guy ever before they gave him the suit and the powers. Unless you're actively trying to troll everyone, but that's a different discussion altogether. The point is, Captain America is about a guy who's actually better than his time period. But with the Fantastic Four, there's no expectation for them to be perfect. Quite the opposite, in fact. So you get to do all the fun, people awkwardly out of step with time business. However, more importantly, it gives you a primary theme, and thus a primary story. You see, the reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe formula works is that it puts the arcs of the main characters at the forefront and makes making you understand and love these people the main focus of every film. 
That's why the bad guys are sometimes so forgettable, because they're not important. They're there to provide the situations for the heroes to develop in. Past Bob is right. Imagine what would happen if at some point Marvel even partly or briefly forgot that lesson and put too much focus on a villain as the driving focus of selling a movie or the entire arc of a phase of movies. Man, that could that could turn out to be a a mistake for a like like a couple different reasons. Yeah. So while we'll talk about villains and plot 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 stuff in part two, this first part all about primary story and character. So, the team is up in space in 1962 because Reed wants to use science to open a wormhole because Space Race Against the Soviets ask your grandparents. They go through the wormhole and wind up in what they'll call the Negative Zone, but we'll recognize as one of those freaky kaleidoscope dimensions from Doctor Strange. So I guess if I made this now, there'd probably be a bunch of Quantum Realm, Multiverse, Spider-Verse, Sacred Timeline, or things we'll hear about Deadpool 3 in here stuff instead, but you get the idea. Maybe a Nihilist flies by, maybe not. The point is, it's full of cosmic rays, they all get zapped, and they get their freaky powers. Reed, summoning all of his strength and revealing his stretch power, reaches out and manages to hit the override switch, blasting them out of the zone and back into low Earth orbit. But now it's 60 years later, even though it's felt like only a moment to them, and we rejoin our post credit scene already in progress, and begin that primary character-centered main story. Because of this time jump, the family's inner journey as they reintegrate into the world of the 21st century as what will eventually be the Fantastic Four will mirror their outer journey. We still feel like our normal selves, but the world is looking at us like a bunch of weirdos. And the key angle to this is the struggle they each go through as members of what is essentially a 60s all-American nuclear family, i.e. father who knows best, supportive homemaker wife, rambunctious kid, and either an older kid, a fun uncle, or a big goofy dog, depending on your view of the thing, trying to accept and thrive in a post all of that 21st century can be expressed through their struggle to also accept and thrive through their power. Specifically, Sue, the invisible woman, is used to literally and figuratively supporting her husband and family sight unseen. But as she comes to understand that today a woman like her can be so much more than that, it can be expressed through the development of all the other stuff her powers can do in the comics. Johnny Storm, the human torch, will be confronting a world where being a show-offy, rebellious goof-off is also called social media media superstar, and he can learn that he, like his fire powers, can be a creative force as well as a destructive one. Ben Grimm the Thing? Well, that's always been easy. Your exterior doesn't need to define you. It's okay for a tough guy to have feelings. We'll talk a little bit more about the Thing in part two. And Mr. Fantastic? Well, as the leader and literal patriarch of the team, and thus the guy who kinda has to take the nominative central spot in this character development as plot narrative, Reed Richards would be a little more complicated. I mean, his allegory Oracle power arc is pretty obvious. He's a stiff who needs to see the value in loosening up. But what would make him different from the others is that while they're all dealing with a world that's full of new possibilities for them, as a square-jawed, all-American, educated, white male, head of household type from 1962, Reed Richards would be dealing with disappointment and resentment. Remember, in the original comics, Reed was partially motivated by guilt at Ben being turned into the thing and was always working on a cure. What I'd propose in this telling is that this would be the way he feels about all four of them, himself included. Something has gone wrong, something is wrong with us, this is abnormal, I have to get us back to normal which can then parallel his initially negative and dismissive view of the modern world. Not in a hateful, rawr, I dislike all these minorities, Sue, make me a sandwich way, but in a, this isn't the future I was trying to build way. Thus, his arc becomes recognizing as a futurist and as a person that he needs to expand his view of change as something to be nurtured rather than fought against. He needs to learn to stretch. Yeah, go ahead and call that little self-satisfaction moment there kind of cringy if you want. Definitely kind of self-indulgent, but I don't give a fuck. I'm still impressed with past me for landing there. This shit ain't easy. Did you see the fucking flash? I did. They had well over a decade and dozens of different screenwriters trying to crack that fucking thing, and the best metaphor they could get in the whole damn movie was Michael Keaton making spaghetti to explain how fake time travel works, and it still isn't good. 
So, to recap, we have an origin story. We have a twist on that origin that allows for the heroes and the aesthetics of their brand to have a retro cool look, vibe, and sound that honors the comics and feels different and fresh in the broader MCU. We have four characters with four individual arcs which together form a single unifying narrative arc. Can this family hold together with the world, themselves, and all the things that make them a family seemingly having changed forever? We have, in other words, a story. Now, what we need is a plot, the action, the whys and whens, and an antagonist to make it all happen. Uh, this is where the break for part two originally was, so there's some editing magic upcoming. All right, so to recap from last time, the foundational gimmick of this pitch is that in this telling, the origin story of the Fantastic Four begins in the early 60s and the cosmic accident that gives them their powers also shoots them into the future, aka our present, thus giving us a strong thematic through line about accepting and thriving amid unexpected changes to both the world and your place in it and an excuse to do fish out of water jokes and have lots of groovy retro fashion, design aesthetics, mannerisms, and needle drop music cues surrounding the main characters. Our heroes are thus a big lug whose monstrous new form has ironically only made his metaphorical skin thinner, an overeager young brat who has a lot to offer if only he can learn to control himself, a woman achieving her potential by recognizing she can be more than an unseen supporting player, and a well-meaning but rigid and reflexively dickish old school dad figure who needs to learn the value of loosening up. Most immediately, by coming to understand that what's happened to him and his family is not a problem to be cured, even though he'll be trying to do that for most of the film. Their growth through the challenges of their individual arcs and shared arcs en route to becoming the Fantastic Four, thus forming our central theme and main narrative thrust. But growth requires challenges, and in superhero movies, challenges are created by bad guys. And for the Fantastic Four's first adventure in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it is absolutely imperative, in my opinion, that the villain of the piece not be Dr. Doom. Stop. Stop. Listen. Dr. Doom is the greatest comic book villain of all time. He has an awesome look, he has a great name, he is a mad scientist and a wizard and a tyrannical dictator and an evil opposite of the main hero and a personal nemesis and a global threat and he has a backstory of his own that's every bit as if not more compelling than the heroes themselves. Which means he is just way too big to burn off in the first movie. You either shortchange him or you shortchange the good guys, neither of those is a good option. You hold off, you do him in the sequel just like the Dark Knight movies did for the Joker. Joker. Period. The end. So here's a prediction I don't outright make in the original episode, but I've said elsewhere, and I'm still pretty comfortable reiterating here. Not only do I think it's the best course of action and the one they'll likely take to not introduce Doctor Doom in the first Fantastic Four movie or make him the main bad guy the first time out, I also think it's a proper and still pretty plausible likelihood that we'll see Doom, or at least some evidence of Doom, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe before the Fantastic Four are actually a thing. To me, that just makes sense. He's way bigger than a one-franchise bad guy, he has boundless narrative usefulness, and his whole Darth Vader, but with more of a Renfair vibe, happening aesthetic doesn't require much explaining for an audience to roll with, I feel like. Bad guy with a suit of armor in a castle, running his own country named Doctor Doom, doing bad shit, kind of handles itself exposition-wise until it's time for Reed to show up and go, oh yeah, I also went to college with that guy, he's all kinds of fucked up. Also, not to do more fanfic -y stuff here, but they're barreling towards some version of Secret Wars, they probably want him around for that, and the modern comics have also tied some of the cleanup work they've done on Doom's Romani backstory to another character in the MCU they'll probably want to touch up in that specific regard as well, so I wouldn't be shocked if those paths align at some point. Maybe anyway. So which villain do I go with? Well, you know, another interesting thing about having the Fantastic Four come to the MCU of the future as part of their origin is that they'll arrive in a world where people having strange powers isn't really that new of a thing. We'll have already had like 20 years of the Avengers, the Defenders, an Infinity War, Spider-Man is swinging around the city, and yes, Peter should absolutely do a cameo where he meets Johnny Storm, that needs to happen. They're new, but they're not all that new. As such, once Reed and his family have been rescued from the shuttle crash and appraised of the situation by, I don't know, S.H.I.E.L.D., I guess, they are immediately approached by a fifth 
main character, a young professional woman, we'll talk about her name later, I don't want you to get distracted, who introduces herself as essentially a super publicist, a talent manager for an agency run by her father, in fact, that aims to help the newly super empowered put public at ease with their poweredness by helping them pick out costumes, nicknames, and assorted do-goodery to help make sure everyone knows that they're heroes like the Avengers as opposed to something else. Now, why wouldn't we have heard of this service before in Spider-Man or whatever? Well, because it hasn't existed before. It's a startup and they haven't really backed any significant clientele. Oh, the father owner guy wants it to feel like he has. He's got a swank office, perhaps in the Baxter building, with these show-offy life-size statues of the Avengers in his lobby, but like not the authentic likenesses because it's kind of iffy exactly how much work he's done with any of them, but he and his daughter see the Fantastic Four as their first real choice prospects. The four could also use the facilities and help navigating the new world, so there you go, match made in heaven. Yes, hardcore Marvel fans, I know you've already figured out where this is going. Have some patience and be considerate of everyone else. Hey, do you think it's notable at all that the MCU version of Taskmaster specifically doesn't have the last name Masters anymore, so it's no longer a random coincidence that a bunch of significant unrelated supporting characters all have that convenient surname like it is in the comics? So as mentioned, Reed will be spending much of his time trying to recreate the Negative Zone experiments in a lab environment in an attempt to cure himself and his teammates. But the others will get to see in action, and Reed eventually, just later, encouraged to do so by the publicist lady, stopping crimes, thwarting disasters, fighting C and D list Marvel bad guys for the right kind of fan service. Like maybe the Wrecking Crew, maybe the Dogs of Hell, maybe some one-off bad guys from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The important thing is that each scenario will be conveniently matched to each member of the team showing off the usefulness of their specific powers. Perhaps a little too conveniently. See the publicist lady? She does have a name, and it's Alicia Masters. Yes, the beautiful blind sculptor who sees through the things in her beauty and becomes his love interest, just like in the comics. But also, just like in the comics, that means that the guy running this whole superhero management thing, her father, is actually Philip Masters, aka the Puppet Master. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm pretty proud of that one. Yes, the villain of our piece is the Puppet Master, a classic Fantastic Four nemesis who doesn't require the kind of explaining that Doom, the Mole Man, or Galactus do. Now, in the comics, the Puppet Master's puppet mastering is mostly about telekinetically controlled puppets made from radioactive clay, but for the purposes of this movie, at least to start with, it'd be more of a metaphorical thing. He's a puppet master because he's not just looking to nurture and manage superheroes, he's also, unbeknownst to Alicia or to anyone else, creating and manipulating the super villains and the crimes and the accidents that his new clients end up being on hand to prevent, thus profiting him on both ends. But his big scheme, his now I'm a super villain scheme, will be to to manipulate and exacerbate Reed's disenfranchisement from the rest of the team and from modernity while also sabotaging the Negative Zone experiment to create a massive accident designed to cause a bigger than ever hero opportunity for the unwitting Johnny and Ben, where even though they'll likely rescue many people, a bunch more will very likely die, including Reed and Sue, because the Puppet Master has decided that the Thing and the Torch are both the most marketable members of the team, but also the ones he can most easily bend to his own will. You know, P.S., whether or not the first half of this predicts the premise of the MCU Fantastic Four, how about some credit for the fact that this whole part absolutely predicted the premise of Incredibles 2, right? Or do I not get credit for that one because we're all finally quietly admitting to ourselves that Incredibles 2 was only just okay? Fortunately, the Fantastic Four figure this out, almost too late of course, and manage to pull together, realizing the full potential of their abilities and the strength of their teamwork, thus bringing their respective shared arcs to a satisfying conclusion. And then, having coalesced as a fully functioning team, they confront Masters himself at his office and, well, because I, I gotta have some proper old school Puppet Master stuff in there, it turns out the tacky Avenger statues in his lobby are actually robots. And our big go-home action sequence is the Fantastic Four fighting and defeating robot puppet doppelgangers of the Avengers. And yeah, you bet your sweet ass the thing fights and defeats the robot Hulk and then makes a point of wanting to know how he'd fare against the real deal because you've got to let people know that's gonna happen. 
Speaking of Hulks, you saw the Thing-style sneakers in that guy's closet in She-Hulk, even though he shouldn't exist in the MCU yet, right? Shelved right there with Cyclops, Deadpool, and the other guys who don't exist yet but we know are coming? That was something. Oh, and also Reed personally confronts the Puppet Master himself, thus symbolically overcoming his own issues with being too controlling by defeating an enemy who is the very embodiment of being too controlling. We close with the Fantastic Four, moving into swank new digs in the Baxter building as tenants of their new landlord and business partner, Alicia Masters, looking ahead to a new world of possibilities, the end. Oops, what mid credit scene? We see a foreboding, mist-shrouded medieval castle overlooking the isolated Eastern European nation of Latveria. Inside the castle, two of a small army of henchmen are monitoring a wall of global news and data screens when something comes across their feed that causes both of them to turn white with fear. Neither one of them wants to have to deal with it. They go rock, paper, scissors. They draw lots. Eventually, one of them just pulls a gun and the other has to go take care of it. We watch this terrified soul as he carries a tablet through the dark halls of the creepy old castle, past the paintings and tapestries and suits of armor, all the way into a pitch-dark great hall where a shadowy figure reclines alone on a dark throne. Shaking like he's literally going to meet his death, the poor henchman approaches the throne, slowly turning the tablet screen around to reveal a news report of the miraculous return of Reed Richards and his missing spaceship to New York City. The figure on the throne's eyes begin to glow, causing the tablet to short out and catch fire in the henchman's hands, he flees for his goddamn life as a single metal glove fist slams down on the stone armrest of the throne. Finally, up into what light there is, stands the unmistakable figure of Dr. F***ing Doom. Doom raises his fists to the sky. He throws back his head. Smash cut back to the exterior of the castle as we hear for the first time ever in the Marvel Cinematic Universe... Richard. So yeah, that's how I'd do it. This was actually pretty fun to write. I hope it was pretty fun for you to watch. And Marvel, if you're out there, I sincerely believe you can do better than I just did. I mean, if you disagree, let's talk about that. You'll find that there is surprisingly little about me that is not for sale. Yeah, that's even more true seven years and a plague later. I mean, I ain't crossing a picket line during this strike, but after that, for real, I'll shoot my shot on whatever you got. You need a draft on NFL Super Pro? I'll pitch on NFL fucking Super Pro. Hit me up. I'm on YouTube. Shame and dignity are first casualties. Let's talk turkey. In all seriousness, looking back, I think this came out pretty good. At the time, and I think as a speculative imagination outlook piece, it holds up pretty decently as well, or as decently as any kind of overeager fanboyism can, I guess. As to the question of whether or not any of this might coincidentally turn out to be right or predictive in the actual movie, I have no idea, and I don't know what it proves or doesn't prove other than I've been doing this long enough to be reasonably good at guessing out common themes and beats in mainstream movie plots. Should I do more stuff like this again, maybe? I've been thinking of taking a longer outlook at James Gunn's DCU planning, but I don't want to jinx anything. Let me know in the comments what you think. The only issue I might have there is that these kind of things take some work, and Patreon is running kind of late lately, but if I saw that go back up, maybe? I mean, tell me what you think. Nothing's set in stone. For now, I'm Bob, and that was a look back at the big picture.